amusing being, I think, quite a bit older, that when, especially her, what was she Okay, when she was reading, I was like, so many common threads. I'm like, now I'm here, over here, over this one. And I'm like, how can there be so many common things with a different generation? We're sisters, yeah. Yeah. Spanning generation. Well, I may adopt you, but we're <laughs> sisters. Uh, okay, that's cool. So this one is also about language in a different way. It's called Cosmic Interpreter. Life has no ground rules for an artist. My life is a mission. I don't have the answers to the whys. They're inside a soul, universal. A few can access. Open minds, blue eyes, feel a tug and respond. I am a cosmic interpreter, speaking a language, universal. No words, only images. The answers, the contradictions, reality, insanity, the feelings are mine, yours everywhere. I put them down, you tell me what they mean. Art is a universal language, the answers are there. You are the interpreter. Okay, this is called, this is one of my little bit psychotic ones. So it's called Upside Down. And this stuff, you know, probably a lot of them do, you know, everybody just falls out and you won't try to worry about what it means. Um, upside Down. I have been upside down, buried under piles of fur shed by ancient cats. When the sun rises, I crawl in, under, hide, sleep, till meows and darkness tap me on the butt, saying, wake up, wake up. We are the meows of modern times, the guardians of your mind, and we demand your attention. The moonlight keeps me company, the meows grate on me, reminding me I am alive. The backward cycle strokes my mind, and as the future flows through my fingertips, smacking loudly against the history of queens, insane, beheaded, with no king to guard the castle. So it is, I am around, around, and always upside down. I am. I am caught between two rainbows on the way to find the sun. Slipping, sliding sideways, finding myself a lightning bolt unleashed. Careful, careful when I strike, striking not to blind mankind, but to enlighten, electrify. Wake up, wake up. Hitchhiking, cosmic riding on a falcon's back. Searching for a forest in which to find myself or perhaps to disappear, to rejoin the tree of life that I am, silent into eternity, the wisdom quiet until lightning strikes. I'm at the start eons ago. I am the violet in my rainbow, painted in my very first painting. I am the blueness in my eyes. I am the rainbow upside down, circling the full moon. I am. Let's go one more. This is called silence. In the silence, I find myself an echo, bouncing off every tree in the universal forest, finding myself again, the last leaf and every leaf, the collector of a silence that holds peace deep within, overwhelming chaos that makes up life. In the silence, all of me comes back and I find my essence. The collector of eternity, still, always there, centered, I find peace. Uh, I have to say that a lot of young people make a mistake of thinking I use like LSD and or you know heavy drugs, and that's why I do this stuff. So no, I don't. This is my brain. <laughs>
<laughs> but if you want to say in Vietnamese, it's Tô Nguyen. Tô? Tô? Nguyen. Now again? Tô <laughs> Nguyen. Oh. It's, a poem. it's a poem to itself. This has never happened before, so everyone here just made history. Thank you. <laughs> I should just leave now? No. I just have some little things. So just moved into a house recently and it's nice I haven't had a house in like I haven't had a home in like I don't even know. So this little thing. This paper grounds me to reality once the ink seeps in and dries. My roots have etched their subterranean spaces and sigh old. There once was a man named Saturno. Behold, all ye who enter here, another gent to add to your public records of men, the men of the world, the men who take long voyages across vast oceans and seas, straits, canals, causeways, pathways. He is always where he is supposed to be. He is complete and whole and exists for what he needs to. His journey is joyous and heart-wrenching too. The sea has shown all of her different colors, not all of them, but the ones that he reached by the sweat of his own brow. The voyage was his own, his own self inside. No one else is inside him except him. He is himself, and there's no changing him, no chaining him down. Only the wings of birds will do. A turkey, an eagle, a hawk, a rooster. Be silent, he says. Be silent. Be silent. Yes, a funeral once again. I am silent. When I am silent, rain leaks from the gutters filled with rotten leaves. I should find something happy. <laughs> that one was too sad. but I'm not really, well, there's this really rough thing that is like this daydream, and I think I should read it if I can find it, but I don't think I can find it. This happened at Book Woman. You know, could you help me? Could you give me some, some energy? Oh, Book Woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to leave today. Today, aujourd'hui, hôm nay, dim tien, hoy, adesso, ahora, matno. I'll leave now, thank you. I have met you. Yes, come on up. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I am Christian Reese, but we all of you too. <clears throat> this poem's called The God of Silence Sings the Blues, Never Moves His Lips. It's about a turtle. <laughs> Silence was a 400 pound turtle the size of a hat box. For years, he slept in a terrarium, chewed lettuce as if the hooked worry of his jaw could sow the howls of college age sex back into the cracks in the, stu in the stucco. His dreams undulated gobs tethered to an amphibian brain, snowy bubbles like how a child would paint thoughts, then erase their insides until the paper tore, the outline ragged, could be anyone's. At this stage, the fucking, the shouting, roaring, mute feelers of bodies of pain papered the box where he slept and shit and dreamt the day he'd wriggle loose his shell, leave it behind, a beetle disassociation. Then the year his keeper left him on the balcony, he ate Jerusalem cherry, peace lily, oleander leaves. He lodged his bulk between the bars, mold over the fall, and stuck like excuses in the throat. Crows ate out his eyes and tongue. These days, silence is a fourth-story concrete patio, stains that refuse to go. 
the turtle skull we hang above the sliding glass door, how each crack is a small mouth, a small silence is left to gape and gum the incoming air. Right. <laughs> one more short one, maybe? Yeah. This one uh, recently got published in the Texas Poetry Calendar 2016, hey! which is awesome. It's great to plug that. That's an awesome publication. Come to Houston tomorrow and come to the reading. There you go. Houston tomorrow <laughs> reading. Dos Capos Press. They're awesome. They're awesome. This is a painting after Jerry Bywater's um, Oil Field Girl. It's at the Atlanta Museum. Oh, wait, that's you? Yeah. I love that poem. That's me. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> uh, Paris, Texas. Uh, this is where he was born. Girls of our cryptid dreams aren't those road signs enough warning that weary gout of sky enough catastrophe. Giants born rent from billboards slashing horizon sprouted legs up from Paris's blush red, bloody lipped arterial conflagrations. No sky, only oil slick and asphalt black. It is the beginning or the end, after all, and I love you like a Roman candle would because who can afford rockets on these clean creation myth afternoons, stylish with giants, unforgivably inflated. Horizon now, biggish women's hips, us scurrying hitchhikers, riggers, indigents, layabouts, fuck-ups, toss-outs, nursing an old, bruised theogony, clotting in quiet, clotting in quiet with Texas clay pen. Ants under heels and skirts. We peek up identical larger skirts, hungry and sharpening stones. Thank you. Angry feminist bar poems, or do we want a slaughterhouse poem? Angry bar poem. Bar poem, okay. Yeah. So like, 10 years ago, I had an uncle who told me I shouldn't drink gin and tonic because that was what bitter 40-year-old divorcees drink, and I would intimidate men. And I have met two of those three categories, uh, so I feel like it's fine to drink gin and tonic. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and so this is called rule. I, so I write a lot of rules poems. I have probably read at least one rules poem every time I've been here. Uh, this is called Rules for Drinking. Parenthetical. If you're a woman, <laughs> every woman in America has some sort of drinking problem. Sources say men will be intimidated if you prefer, prefer gin to vodka, red wine to white. They will be intimidated if you take your whiskey straight, eschew salt and lime with your tequila shots, but apple teenies and Chardonnay won't get you any respect. Sources say women don't like beer, so people might be confused when you order one, much less drink it. You're a gold digger if you prefer top shelf, but an emasculating feminist if you pay your own tab. You will intimidate men if you can hold your liquor, if you know when to stop. Translation. You'll intimidate men if they can't use alcohol to get you in bed. Of course, you won't be respected if you're a lightweight. You will get thrown out of the bar if you punch the bartender who tries to kiss you without permission. A bar is not designed to be anyone's safe haven. Um, I'll do one more, because it is, it's back to school time. Um, yes, it is. and. Um, this is called Why I Teach. Uh, the title was stolen from um, Lupe Mendez's poem of the same title. And the epigraph is from his poem, I Teach to Be Humble. I teach because standing at the front of a classroom explaining commas for the millionth time to students who don't care about commas, who are worrying about their kids, about how they're going to finish their homework when they have to do a double shift tonight, that is more gratifying than sitting at a desk draining my eyesight and a computer's glow donating my life to make a CEO wealthy. I teach because someone tried to silence me again and again, but all the attempts at duct tape lips, banana gags, threats are nothing compared to what half this classroom faces. Erasure from reading lists, erasure from movies, erasure from government that claims they have no right to exist in this country, erasure from police who claim they have no right to exist in these streets. I teach because even the students who don't like me give me reason to get up in the morning. I te don't teach to make them like me. I teach so they don't feel they have to stay silent.
Thanks for making this space. Thank Thanks for making this space. Um, this is a poem. This poem is an essay from a series of essays about like antiquated medical practices, and it's like written in fragments. So every time it moves from one fragment to the other, I'll just like snap. So this is on trepanation, which is they used to drill a hole in your head. Okay, to like, well, we'll get we'll get into it. <laughs> Logic at its root is a medical instrument. Ten percent of human skulls recovered from the Stone Age have silver dollar-sized holes bored out of them. The bone removed, the button opened. The tools they must have used to perform this surgery were crude, rudimentary, rock-made, ignoble implements, must have had good reason. The brain swells to twice its size just thinking of it. Surely that logic is a logic of monsters, the way a demon takes up residence in the gray matter, builds a haunt shack below the bridge of your nose, and through the board hole said demon can be released from its captive inelastic concavity. The homosexual, since his invention, has been a creature held captive in the skull. Simple ritual, touch the back of your head, imagine an absence where the solid matter is, trace the serrated ridge, imagine what might have come sprinting from your head if only you had the acumen to drill a hole in it. Athena was born this way. Phineas Gage is said to have had a metal rod pass through his brain and emerge out the other side a swan. In the film Pi, the hero learns the true name of God by opening his octipital bone. Every instrument of torture is born this way. Every instrument of sound and surgery, every painting and chair and chariot, every ritual and rite of passage, every word and hermeneutic. The skulls of fetuses come soft and in pieces so they can pass easier through their mothers into the world. The fontanelles harden with age until, behold, your new adult shape. Perhaps that ancient surgery, then, is less about monsters and more an argument for the preservation of youth. To break apart the skull so you might pass back through your mother into oblivion. I understood this all, smoking cigarette after cigarette on the front porch of a man who had gripped my head as if he were trying to dissemble it. How much easier it would have been had he succeeded. Smoke rising through the hole in me. After I laid beside him in the position all humans take when preparing for sleep, regardless of age or history or what terrible things they've just done with their hands. Thank you.